the Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies will uh, come to order. I want to first of all thank you, Secretary Acosta, for appearing before the subcommittee today to discuss the, the uh, department's budget that you submitted for 2020. The request is about in line with what you asked for last year and about 10 percent below what the committee decided you needed to operate last year. Um, I think the budget includes a handful of what I would consider to be forward leaning and positive proposals, uh, funding of apprenticeships, uh, veterans workforce training, uh, employer compliance assistance. Uh, however, I think we're going to want to discuss some of the cuts that are proposed. Now, if things are duplicative or ineffective, we, we hope you can help us make that case because we don't want to have programs that aren't doing what they should do. I know you've had to um, make difficult decisions, and in fact, in previous budgets, we've made difficult decisions as this committee has set sort of committee-wide different priorities than we might have had in the past. Um, however, as I, I said before, it's about the same proposal that you made a year ago, and it's not where we wound up a year ago. Uh, I think we want to look at the $703 million cut in the Job Corps program uh, and hear what you have to say about that. Um, we want to focus on programs that uh, start workforce training, the apprenticeship uh, programs, and uh, we have strong ideas on that, as you do. I know you and I were at the Carpenters Joint Apprenticeship Training Facility in St. Louis uh, earlier uh, in the year, or maybe it was late last year. I think it was earlier this year. But you know what I noticed at that particular location was how many people had been about out of high school about 10 years. It seemed to me there was a real uh, significant number of 28 and 30-year-old people who had their own story of their lost decade of trying to figure out what they wanted to do. I hope you can help us figure out how we can help you uh, and uh, high schools particularly figure out some of the better alternatives uh, that are out there. Uh, with uh, registered apprenticeship programs, I think we currently are training about 1,300 uh, apprenticeships in uh, the carpentry trades, for instance, and those programs seem to be working. Uh, the budget requests further investment toward workforce programs that are responsive to the needs of people looking for work, including veterans and military spouses. I just uh, talked to our General Assembly last week about the importance of transferring skills that military spouses bring to the uh, next military assignment with them, but also of looking at skills that veterans have achieved in the military and doing everything we can to be sure that those same skills are recognized as completely and quickly as possible when people uh, leave the military. So we're glad you're here. I'll have a longer statement for the record. Well, thank you. I was obviously eager to get to uh, our question time, and um, always I'm glad to hear uh, your comments, particularly the fact that uh, those um, programs that have direct contact with uh, workplace issues that you've increased slightly the budget for those. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Rural Workforce uh, Initiative that this committee started in 2018, FY2, FY18, uh, dealing with the Delta Regional Center and the Appalachian Regional Center, the unemployment rates, and even in a good economy, are still way, well higher than the national average. We have now appropriated $60 million for this initiative, and you've asked for another 30, but none of that money has yet been spent. At least I don't believe it's been spent. I, my, my sense is since you're asking for more money, these programs can work. What are you doing to get that money out the door now? And to see that they work. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you, thank you for the question. I, I, I think we we all agree that this is uh, a good investment, and that this, in fact, should go forward. Um, the the way the appropriation was written, in the opinion of our attorneys, created difficulty uh, as it was written. 
Um, I, I think this committee intended the money to go to the regional commissions and have those commissions disperse it to, uh, to individual entities within the region. Um, our attorneys, uh, however, um, said that based on the language, we had to do the disbursement directly to the individual entities. Uh, we have entered into an MOU with the regional commissions where we are providing uh, funds for the regional commissions to do technical assistance so that the individual entities can apply to us with the assistance of those regional commissions. So the individual entities will apply to us as our budget attorneys say they have to, but with the assistance of those regional commissions. Going forward, I hope that, that our staffs can work together and my understanding is they are working together um, to develop appropriate language so we don't have to face this next year. It's a technical- And you issue. would hope we can put that language in, in this next appropriating bill? I, I, absolutely, I, I think everyone agrees on what this should look like. Uh, there is a technical legal issue that we're working around. We've issued the MOU uh, and entered into the MOU with both the Delta and, and I apologize, I forget the, the other- regional, Appalachian. With both the Delta and the Appalachian Regional Commissions so that we can disperse the money with their assistance as, as um, they work with their local grantees. Let's move to the, um, what I think was about a 40% proposed cut for Job Corps, that over $700 million cut. Does that mean you're gonna eliminate 40% of the locations in the country or what do you expect to do with that? Mr. Chairman, I, um, I think I mentioned to you when we spoke uh, earlier this year, the, the debate over Job Corps is one that goes back several decades. Um, this committee is going to determine the appropriate funding level for Job Corps as it did last year and the year before that. And, and, we, um, and, and so we have concerns about the program. Irrespective of funding level, uh, we are proceeding based on those concerns with reforms to the program that we think may be helpful. And so we're using our pilot project authority, working with governors that are interested to, uh, to try different pilot projects in particular states. Um, so yesterday, for example, I shared that, that we're starting a Job Corps Scholars uh, pilot program. Uh, it's small, it's only 20 million, but we, uh, we issued a request for proposal for community colleges to set up many Job Corps within those community colleges, cohorts of 40 students. Uh, they would receive funds that would cover tuition, that would cover housing, that would cover counseling services. And interestingly, it would be at about half the cost per student of a Job Corps center, because Job Corps centers, depending on the particular center, sometimes thirty to $40,000 per student per year. Uh, we're also working with, um, in Idaho, for example, uh, with the governor, the Job Corps is now being managed or about to be managed by their local community college. Um, and so we are trying different approaches to see what works and what doesn't work, and we will proceed as, as this committee sees fit on the Job Corps program. Are there are a couple of USDA-run Job Corps in the country. I know we've got one in Missouri. I've, I've been told that they are no longer interested in running those programs. The, the, the USDA has, uh, has indicated that they, they have concerns as to the effectiveness of those programs. Um, and, and if they do, uh, if they do withdraw, then we would look program job core by job core and determine whether to, to close that center, whether to consolidate that center or whether to convert that center into something different. And you're working with the states on that? Uh, we'd be working with, uh, the USDA and the states on that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Um, chairman, let me hit, hit, I have four or five other things I'd like to get on the record here before we make a determination about how we deal with the rest of this uh, hearing. What can you do, what can we do to work with the Department of Education to create a better sense in high school of um, the, the, old, the variety of paths that people have, the variety of career paths they have? You know, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, the focus on associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees and graduate work. Uh, but I think you and I have both seen a number of instances now where people get out of high school, they maybe do one semester of college, uh, and then kind of drift into various uh, part-time things that don't really lead them where they eventually figure out they need to be going. How can we, how can we get more information out there earlier? 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I think this is incredibly important. I think one thing that, that, that matters, it's difficult to do from the Senate, but it's really a local issue, is how do counselors in high schools get rewarded? Do they get, um, do they get recognized solely based on how many of their students go to college, or do they get recognized based on whether uh, the maximum number of their students find a path forward to success? Mm -hmm. Because success can be very different things. Success can be a great welding job that, that can pay sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. I read an article last week about an oil, rigging, oil riggers that are making almost 200000 a year or success can be college. And that counselor is so critical early on. Well, I think that's right. In fact, I told a, a group yesterday that maybe we ought to be evaluating high schools as opposed to how many people get into college, how many people five years after they're out of high school have a job that pays at least $60,000 a year. And you know, obviously there's a window there that's not quite as, quite as quick as you've enrolled in college in the next fall. But it's a measurable window and would be a much greater indication probably of whether people were prepared for where they eventually may wind up headed in life. Air, airplane mechanics, welders, electricians, all of those things. And on that topic, well, let's start with veterans and military spouses. But what can we do to further encourage states to accept uh, credential skills you know, somebody, for instance, in the military has been driving a truck for three years. It would seem to me that getting a commercial truck driving license should not be an obstacle. Or if they've been an electrician or a, um, doing uh, some kind of medical medical assistance work, those kinds of things, we need to do a better job, I think, transitioning them into what is now a very tight workforce where people are looking for people. And what can we do to encourage eliminating needless obstacles there. M Mr. Chairman, I think uh, you raise a very, very important point. Um, uh, someone can be licensed to drive a truck in Fallujah and literally uh, not be licensed to drive a truck when they leave the military and come, you know, come back to, to their home. Um, and, you know, states seem to have difficulty addressing this. These are often caught up in local issues and local politics. And I think um, it would behoove uh, this Congress to look at how it can um, encourage, should I say, states to to really look at these licensing issues, their barriers to entry. Um, I think of one state where a license to install fire alarms costs more than a license to be a practicing lawyer. And not only are they barriers to entry for individuals that are leaving the military and, and coming back home, but they're barriers for entry often for those who can least afford to pay these licenses. Um, uh, this is a real, real issue. Depending on, um, depending on studies, Federal Reserve estimates 1.5 million Americans. Uh, Brookings says 3 million Americans not working because of licensing issues. They've just decided we're not going to pursue this license. Now, some states, and I think Missouri is one, one of those that's getting pretty aggressive in this area of on the topic of military spouses, who, of course, the strength of the military, military families and military spouses uh, getting credentialed quickly when they move as the person who's serving is transferred uh, to a new base. I think we had the first person uh, sworn in immediately as a member of the Missouri Bar when, uh, she was, when one of the military spouses uh, was sworn in in January and immediately was going to work as a lawyer, something that in our state would not have happened before without uh, substantial time being involved, and whether it's that or teaching or, um, again, health care provider or, or whatever, I think that's another area that's fairly easy to open that door. Everybody understands why that door and the veterans' door should open. But it also seems to me in this kind of economy, uh, states should want to compete with each other to see who can make it the easiest to move skilled, for skilled people to move to your state, and frankly, I hope my state leads the way on that. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I've, I've heard it said that we recruit an individual, but we retain a family in the military. Mm -hmm. And uh, military spouses uh, sacrifice a lot so that, um, that the service person can be in the military and defend us. And uh, to ask them to choose between maintaining the integrity of the family unit 
or their career, I, I think, is, is it's just an inappropriate and wrong choice. And so military spouses, um, the, the military service person has to move on orders typically every two years. And the military spouse then has to decide, do I move or do I keep my career? And to have to relicense every time someone moves and wait to get that license and go through that process and pay those fees and that bureaucracy seems wrong. And so some mechanism of, of recognition where if a spouse is temporarily in a state, um, that state recognizes the license in the home state, I think would be a wonderful idea and something I'm working with some governors to encourage uh, states to adopt.